Well, Cornwall always, uh, to me, I mean, it, 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 it's such a beautiful county. It, 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 it's, it's more than home. It's more like heaven in some ways. Um, and I remember my first trips outside of the county as I started to progress my career with English China clays. And I remember returning, it was in fact from a trip overseas, my first long trip, which was to the United States. And I got to the Cornish border at uh, Lanson, crossed over the Tamer, and um, I became quite emotional. I had to stop the car, and I thought, I'm home. Few people, even in Britain, connect Cornwall with industry. It's a great tourist center, a holidaymaker's paradise. Every summer, visitors come to places like Parr to bask in Cornish air and sunshine munch their Cornish pasties and Cornish cream teas, send home postcard views of Cornish scenery. From the beach, they watch the ships come and go all day long out in the bay. Driving around inland, they see the great sand tips beside the clay pits. But in spite of all this, many of them have little idea that in this corner of Britain, they're within sight and sound of a great industry employing 6,000 people and providing a basic raw material of the highest quality, without which their own lives would be vastly different. A world of clay, supplying clay to the world. And here the water wheel is actually uh, worked with, you can see there's a, an elevated leet okay. coming into the wheel. So that's feeding it, it the water. So that delivers yeah, the water to the wheel. Way yeah. uh, the water wheels really had gone by, I would say, the, the mid-1930s, with minor exception. Yeah. Uh, steam had taken over and had sort of gone, gone from late 19th century to coincide with wheels and, and again worked steam. In fact, the last steam engine to work in the clay industry was as late as 1959. Uh, but electricity, proper, ste proper, steam proper steam engine, but electricity started to take over quite rapidly, initially with uh, individual, the larger works having their own generation, uh, normally um, some form of oil or diesel engine, uh, a, a dynamo. And then in uh, 1935, English China Clays, who were beginning to be basically absorbing all the smaller companies, uh, they built a central power station, which they bought uh, second hand uh, from one of the London boroughs. And uh, overnight, um, it was, um, I think, Enfield. And it produced, it was only 10 years old when it came, a uh, brand new building for it, but it was rehoused and it produced uh, 10 megawatts. That was a lot of power in those days. And it, it worked up until um, 1984. And we still on the same site have a large uh, oil engine, uh, which again, during times of power shortage or when uh, we've been forced to basically shed load to help the national grid, uh, then keeping the pumps in the pits working is the essential part, otherwise they flood. And so we've, we've always got enough power to actually man the pumps yeah. uh, during the... Isn't it funny that I think r most people don't really r recognize that trying to keep water out of mines is the... Oh, huge, revolution. hugely important. Um, but if you've never been mining... <laughs> Oh, here's uh, my good friend Malcolm, who is still working for the company, but is one of the guides here. Hello. Morning, Hello. Malcolm. Let me introduce you? Richard to you. Hello, Richard. Very nice to How see you. Do? How do you do? Brilliant. You like to lead the way, Malcolm. We'll, uh, we'll on. go on and have a look at the viewing platform. And of course, 
a little bit of history from uh, one of the local foundries. And foundries, of course, are an important part yeah. of Cornwall's development of mining, both for uh, copper and tin, and of course, more recently, uh, the china clay industry followed on and became much bigger than copper and tin in Cornwall at one time. Is the confidence, I suppose the word would be vernacular, but I mean the conf <coughs> confidence of <coughs> all the built. I mean the idea, you know, this, to specify that wall or bund or whatever we would call it, you know, you'd, you might get an RIBA prize for this now, but that was normal. Yeah. yeah. And there were and again, 50 people who knew how to do it and they were yeah. so self-sufficient in building materials because of Cornwall's unique geology. Uh, we, we had, as well as the very soft kaolinized granite, we had hard granite available within the same working area yeah. which were used for uh, building a lot of the structures. And that is just a gorgeous thing. Yeah. Don't ask me to do it. Do you want to take it out now? No, yes, yeah, we'll, we'll just snip it out. I mean, that's dentistry, isn't it? That is. Oh, it is. Yeah. Almost made a lot of pictures. And is that a rubber wheel? I mean, between uh, 18, say 50, and uh, 1870, uh, the Cornish population probably almost halved with miners going overseas. To so they went the other way? Yeah, every, every corner in the world where there was something to get out of the ground, Cornish miners ended up. Wherever there's a deep hole in the ground. There's a Cornishman there. <laughs> Is there any kind of society that connects those people up? Uh, there are various Cornwall societies in, uh, I mean, South Africa, North America, South America, Australia. Uh, hello. Hello. Right the old Cornwall society. Very effect I mean, obviously, when you were talking, I, I am. Um, it would be very odd if I wasn't affected. <laughs> but it, it, that, the thought that, because I think we're very, very bad at talking about human dispersion. In, in Australia, for example, there's a, a, an Australian Cornish society. And people are very, very proud of their heritage and their roots. Yeah. And uh, one of the, uh, the most amusing collection of cartoons, which deals largely with the Cornish dialect, was written by a man called Oswald Pryor, whose father went as a mine captain uh, into one of the mines in Australia. And, uh, 1830s. 1830s, yeah. The, the big migration, though, was really between 1850 and 1870, with the collapse in the uh, price of copper and tin, particularly copper. Uh, miners literally fled Cornwall to go where the, uh, the, the, the ore was cheaper. So, in a sense, the price was dropping because supply was coming from somewhere else, yeah. and then the miners went to they, they, to somewhere else. They went to be part and to be expert in, in basically yes, yeah. the skill that they had developed. Yeah. And Cornwall, of course, still to this day, leads the world with one of the finest mining schools, Camborne yeah. School of Mines, yeah. which is part of Exeter University yeah. now. But it's quite rare to be in such a dense, very dense story where a all those big words, which m most people are pretty ignorant of, sort of economy, uh, social cohesion, uh, family structure, um, industry, uh, distribution, are all sort of knotted together with emigration. Yeah. And which, of course, is all humans are anyway, <laughs> which is, you know, if you're hungry, you better go somewhere where there's some food. Um...
is it chalk in the water? What is it? No, what, what remember that we're, we're right in the heart uh, of the St. Austell granite, which has been kaolinized. In other words, the granite has become soft and the feldspar we now know as China clay. And uh, here, naturally, the, the stream is picking up the, the clay uh, from the, the, the ground that the stream is running over. But historically, the micaceous residues, which themselves are white, uh, and granite comprises three minerals, quartz, feldspar, mica. Feldspar becomes China clay. Mica is discarded, as is the quartz. Uh, the mica, historically, went down the local rivers, the Pa River, the St. Austell River, and the River Fowl. And because there was so much of this white residue going in the St. Austell River, it has for many years been referred to as the White River. Which and it is no longer. It, which it is no longer, <laughs> other than sometimes in very exceptionally heavy rain. And again, you will get the scouring uh, of, of the, uh, the source and the stream of the river. Uh, which will carry uh, whiteness out to sea. The clay, sand and water run away as a milky river across the floor of the pit. Water is the clay manufacturer's most useful ally. It dislodges the clay for him, transports it, helps him to grade and refine it. Left to itself, of course, it'll cheerfully carry a lot of unwanted matter around as well. But fortunately, solids in suspension obey known laws, depending on particle size, density, rate of flow, and so on. The art, therefore, lies in making use of the water to do the right things at the right time. It's chiefly a matter of causing the mixture to flow in a way which will persuade the small particles which you want in this case, the clay, to stay at the top, and the large stuff, the sand, to sink to the bottom, where it can be scooped out. The coarse sand travels away by conveyor belt to the top of the great tips whose gleaming whiteness deludes many a visitor to Cornwall into thinking they must be the China clay, when in fact they're merely a byproduct. Quite interesting, there's one of the old pumps that has been uncovered. Oh, the one you showed us, uh, like, um like the one that's standing down below. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this formerly was two separate clay pits. Uh, this on the right is Wheel Martin, and the pit here on the left is Green Splat. Now, in um, 2012, the Green Splat pit was one of five still operated independently uh, by a company called Goonveen China Clay. And uh, that was the last independent China clay company in Cornwall to be acquired by the multinational Imerus Minerals. And uh, the combination of these two pits now uh, produce up to 4,000 tonnes a week of clay. But remember that for every tonne of clay, uh, up to nine tonnes of residue are generated. Uh, and that will be made up of sand, uh, around uh, three and a half tons. Uh, you've got uh, overburden, which can contain quite a lot of rock, uh, which can be up to four tons. Uh, and then you've got mica, about a ton. Uh, those do vary slightly, but the, the average works out at somewhere in the order of eight to nine tons of per, ton. per ton of clay. Yes. Richard, can you just get up here a sec? Yeah. Uh, just while we're here, uh, I'll, I'll point out, I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, we, we get rid of some of our rock and sand into the construction industry. And of course, we do, we do have to, to blast on a regular basis. And just in front of me here, you can see a drilling rig, uh, which is putting down blast holes, which will be charged with explosive. And uh, there you can see a shot fire as hideaway. That's a shelter. That's a shelter. So, if they were blasting close to us here 
on the edge of the pit, uh, the shot firer would go into there and uh, set the charge off and wait in there in the shelter so the until the, uh, the blast had subsided. <laughs> it's over 200 years or so since a perceptive and persevering English West Countryman first located clay in Cornwall. He probably attacked it with a spade and carried it away on a pack horse. And for generations, dozens of small firms operated on much the same scale. Today, with most of the sources of supply concentrated under one management, the scene is transformed. The demand for clay is enormous and growing. Two and a half million tons a year come from the pits in the southwest. One and three quarter million tons are sent around the world to 60 different countries. China clay is Britain's second largest bulk export, an achievement which has earned for English China clays the Queen's Award for Industry. Yeah, when I, I started work in the mid-1960s, uh, the landscape was referred to by many people uh, as the, the, the lunar landscape. And this is really because many of the tips were cone-shaped and it gave this rather weird uh, impression and everything was white. We started in the 1970s going down the road of uh, actually implementing uh, quite a comprehensive landscaping program which included uh, seeding grass on tips, uh, the development of quite large areas of woodland and gradually over the last 50 years uh, we've developed a far more gentle landscape and created literally thousands of acres of uh, woodland uh, and, and grassland. And uh, you can see, in fact, just looking behind us, uh, some of the remains of the older tipping regime, which would have been to elevate the sand uh, up an inclined railroad, very steep, one in two gradient. And uh, these tips were visible from wide parts of Cornwall, for example, I remember going to Trencrom Hill near St Ives and looking back and thinking, oh, there's my clay country. Or when one, ar yeah, when one arrived back in Cornwall, having been to England, crossing the border uh, of the, uh, the, the county between Devon and Cornwall over the River Tamer, and just climbing up towards Lanson itself, uh, you then had that elevated view looking back across Bodmin Moor and then in the background you would see clay country coming into view and again it was a view of uh, conical tips. I mean what's very strange to me is that your experience is, is, crosses exactly the period of mass tourism so you know only a few people got to see the world either because they were in the forces or they were rich enough to see the world. So there's a very funny thing about the history of the picturesque, um, uh, exoticism, uh, the way that, that particularly the English who live on an island, and we might include the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish, but the island people who, who are very odd about elsewhere, you know, they, that there are people called foreigners that they sometimes can be very emphatic about. But sort of tied into all of that is, is wonder at landscape and, what, and also I think a quite deep misunderstanding which would go right back into the 17th, 18th century where landscape is made by people. You know, the, the, you, landscape is geology but then people start fiddling with the surface and it's called agriculture yeah. or architecture or, or mining or... So there's this very, quite, I think, quite a problematic thing in our politic now where we don't really understand that we, we're looking at ourselves. And, of course, I'm envious that you... I mean, this is... a 50-year compass. Probably one of the most densely... Uh, mined areas, uh, albeit mining is all open cast, no underground mining here, but because of the open cast nature of working, it is so visible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we've got some of our disused pits now, uh, which are, are becoming, you know, beauty spots in their own right because they will naturally fill with water. Yeah. And uh, literally a, a mile from here, 
we have a, a, a 300 acre China clay pit which operated up until uh, 2006, uh, which is now more or less full uh, to the point of overflowing uh, and is, is a huge uh, water resource. And in fact, some people water ski on it and uh, some people fish in it. So uh, Completely the, 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 the industrial landscape sometimes has a second life in a quite different style. Yeah. Can you, you said, what, how many tips would we have been looking at here? Roughly? In the height of the uh, regime before landscaping began, in the really 1970s, uh, there would have been, uh, certainly as a round figure, about 100 of the sky tips. And uh, the, those sky tips, as the industry itself grew larger and the industry consolidated, largely under the, the ownership of one company called English China Clays, who themselves were taken over 20 years ago by the French company Imeris. But that consolidation and uh, the, uh, the sort of increase in the size of the operations altered the landscape uh, before the actual landscaping itself started uh, as, a, as a major part of the, the way in which we had to move forward uh, from the 1970s onwards. Well, that's. I mean, that's perfect because then suddenly we have the verb to landscape. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, we could perhaps uh, call up Capability Brown or, or whoever, Repton, you know, the people who w were a bit vigorous about pushing it around, but for purely aesthetic reasons, all, all taken from mostly French painting, yeah. French-Italian painting, which is such a, you know, and again, you know, th the English are great consumers, you know. They like a good postcard. <laughs> and of course, this whole area has been uh, much photographed and painted and filmed. And uh, I actually, as a young mine captain in the 1970s, uh, had a first class blasting certificate. And uh, we were, in fact, approached by the BBC could they use one of our locations to film? Uh, a complete series of Doctor Who when John Pertwee was playing yes. the Doctor. And uh, I designed a blast and brought down about 8,000 tonnes of rock, which allowed us to then construct an incline to put some new pumps onto. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting the director of that 1971 production uh, last year, and we revisited the whole scene and remembered Doctor Who and his exploits in the, uh, the Baal Pit. And Was that filmed? That's filmed, yes. Uh -huh. it, it, it's available. Uh, you can uh, see it uh, either. Uh, it's in a, a collection of Doctor Who uh, CDs yes. which are available. But your new visit, but the second did, visit was filmed as well. It was filmed, yes. Yeah. And that, that was, became a documentary on BBC. Yeah. And uh, it, it's just one example of, of many times that we've had filmmakers working down here. Yeah. I think the other thing about um, how we watch space. Uh, so I was a schoolboy when um, Lawrence Arabia was made, which is really a film about blue and blue and yellow, yes. with the occasional camel and uh, Anglo or foreign. You know, the, the conversation between them. It's quite complicated to, if you take to pieces what is being articulated. And I think probably in mainstream filmmaking, you can probably, ch as they land on the moon, as the mentality of the first time we all saw the Earth as a, in space, but photographed by a, a human, there's something to do with the exoticness of landscape, the, the strangeness of landscape, and... Um, Maybe also tied up with all extreme sports, you know. I can walk across there and I won't die. You know, yeah. The, 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 a kind of ever bigger garnering of, of uh, what the world could look like and how it might actually see us off, which in a, we're in a moment where it seems like it might have a good go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the eternal optimist. I, uh, I, I look forward. <laughs>
Yeah. It's rather strange that uh, today, you know, every mine engine power is, is valued. Uh, and there was a period uh, in the uh, 1960s and 70s when everyone was saying, oh, what an eye for all those old engine houses. We must get those off the landscape. They are a hugely valued feature now. Yes. It's part of Cornwall's very yeah. rich mining heritage. Did that mean that a lot were demolished? Oh, they were, yeah. 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 And you see, you know, photographs of Red Roof and Camborne during the heyday of mining in the 18th and 19th centuries. And, I mean, you just couldn't see anywhere without spotting engine houses. <laughs> they were everywhere. The new landscape. Yeah. <laughs> well, I say, we, we had the, um, the privilege, I suppose, if you're a, a, a mining historian and enthusiastic about the history of mining, the privilege of having the last working beam engine in Cornwall, worked until 1959, in where we've just been looking at, the Greens Flat Pit, which is now combined with Will Martin, who worked as one pit. by letting it flow slowly through shallow troughs, allowing the coarse, heavy particles uh, to settle. At set times, this coarse traction was pushed out by men with tools called shine, and it was retreated and sold as a biter. Having, you know, perfected the fact that this clay in Cornwall, and then later in Devon, 1830 onwards in Devon, uh, was ideal for making uh, particularly porcelain. Um, the idea soon spread to the Staffordshire potteries. And, um, and because... were they in, in Wedgwood mates or commercial? Uh, no, they, 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 they really didn't know each other at all. Oh, isn't that strange? Uh, that... But, uh, Cook, Cookworthy uh, went on to develop and tried to basically contain the use of the clay for his own uh, Cookworthy pottery. Uh, but soon... Was that in a, competi a commercially competitive yeah. kind of line? Yeah. It's my but, idea. But the, the word <laughs> soon got around. But because Stoke had plenty of fire clay for cheaper, you know, earthenware and the likes, uh, the Staffordshire potteries was well established with their bottle kilns. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't long before the likes of all the, the, the large Staffordshire producers were down in Cornwall. And for a short time, probably no more than 50 years, some actually worked the clay works under their own account, yeah. employing local labour yeah. and a local captain yeah. to manage the works. Yeah. Uh, but things, how would anything move around? It went canal, by sea. No, you see. Yeah, so, and, and then the canal yeah. uh, largely from ports like Runcorn and down the Trent. So all the way up. Yeah. yeah. Those of us who came in at the point of transition from still being a very manual, labour-intensive industry started to see quite rapid changes in technology and development of technology. Uh, it was appreciating that change and then scale as well because, you know, the, the standard dump truck size in the mid-60s uh, would be 10, 12 tonnes they'd carry, uh, and now we're up to 70 tonnes. So, so all these yes. changes ha happened yeah. really quite rapidly over two or three decades. And, uh, you know, we, without realising it, we, we, we went from, 
you know, the pick and shovel uh, to the computer. Yeah. And I, I can recall... We are those like, people. Yeah. Some of the, <laughs> the old guys, oh, I'll never get to anger this boy. Now they did. <laughs> yeah. And soon we're typing away, yeah. you know, on the yeah. keyboard. Yeah. From the Saturn pits, the clay was gravitated into conditioning tanks, where it's thickened for a couple of months. The clay was taken then by gravity or hand tram and spread in a mat over the heated tiles. When it had been dried, the finished clay was shoveled into the linen or store. I think the thing that's very striking is, is the confidence of it. I mean, it's, you know, there's a little bit of feeling like you're in a very, very old culture, you know, in Mexico, um, you know, a religious site yes. <laughs> where everybody, you know, th these are not, you don't move stones around like this very readily. Um, and I, th I think that's part of where my sort of sense of humility comes from. You know, you're near, you're near physical, embodied physical labour. And, but everybody knew what they were doing. Ah, OK. Wow. So lifting up, what, is the shovel got a special name? Oh, uh, no, that's just a, a shovel. But, <laughs> shovel is a shovel, but... And but, all of the other things have got special but names. Putting that in there, that's sticky. Yes. It's quite hard, to... hard manual work. And yes. Back -breaking and work. then and then you've got to lift it, empty it, yep. bang it. And you know, basically flatten it out on the kiln floor. Will we come out this way? Uh, no, we'll we we'll, we'll just walk through quite true. Here you can see <gasps> the kiln floor. And uh, you okay. can see the tracks, because this was the furnace. The furnace is just behind yep. the little cabin. So this is a very hot yeah. spot. And you gradually reduce the thickness. And it would dry within uh, 12 to 15 hours on the furnace end. But at the stack end, which was much cooler, uh, it would be up Two to weeks. five days. OK, yeah. And but it's a hypercost, isn't it? Yes. I mean, the Romans would have recognised it. And Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. It would never have occurred to me that clay was moved in a barrel. So the barrel would have weighed... 200 weight. 200 weight. Really? As little as that? Yes. A sta a, this size? Yeah. Really? Yeah. God. Wow. A little bit of... This, this lorry was found under a sand pit. Ah! Oh. In 1958. No way. So that's the First World War. Yeah, it was the First World War truck. This is exactly the type of truck that came in. No way. And, and peer, uh, no. So it had just got buried. Yeah. Run out of petrol, bury it. It's, it's been on, on runs. It's done the uh, <laughs> London Brighton run. <laughs> Have you ever driven this one, Malcolm? No, no. If you want another story. How amazing. Flooded former working. Is 2006 effectively a a world it supply was, and demand moment? It was um, the point of no return in the fact that the paper industry had developed 
a, 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 a way of using calcium carbonate in the way that clay had always been used as the natural whitening. Calcium carbonate is far more available and cheaper than China clay, and rightly so. China clay has many more industrial uses, including paint, rubber, plastics, sealants, adhesives, pharmaceuticals, uh, and of course, still widely used worldwide, clays from Cornwall go to the worldwide ceramic industry. But the paper industry, which had been the, the major user of the clays for almost 100 years, from the beginning of the 20th century, uh, had reached a point where uh, it was just unprofitable to keep the works running because we were getting competition. And to be fair, English China clays, I would have to acknowledge, had failed to see the Im impending change coming quick enough. And that's why we were taken over in 1999 by the French. The French gave it their best shot, but then in 2006 said, we, we, we've got to bite the bullet. We've got to take a million tonnes of uh, annual production out of the scheme of things and concentrate on the ceramic and other markets, which we now do. And those markets are still very successful. So that's really an absolutely classic industrial story of being behind a curve yeah. or ahead of a curve. And, I, and I, I, I've got so much documentary evidence, which eventually will go to the China Clay History Society, which I retain at home. And uh, I have started, but I, 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 whether I will ever finish, uh, the uh, demise of a Cornish great, and it would be the history of English China clays, and how in its last 20 years, just about every trick in the book was not acknowledged, and we should have acknowledged and got out sooner without such a painful withdrawal with 800 job losses, which was catastrophic at the time. But in a much bigger picture, that could be a Fleet Street, you know, this, the, the all these questions of distribution, you yeah. know, what, so we grew up with newspapers, they were delivered to the door, da, da, da. Um, you know, the Murdoch moment or whatever, but that very odd feeling where you have skills and crafts and, you know, because I can remember being held up, probably have your paper being delivered in Farrington Road. <laughs> Yeah. You know, these huge toilet rolls, and you would sit in the traffic while the truck reversed in with these, I don't know what the diameter of the rolls were, but proper, you know, next day's paper. Yeah. And that will be 73, see, 74. We, we, we did everything in-house. Uh, it's hard to believe now that we, we managed to get up to just about a 1,000 vehicles. Uh, we had depots as far north as Preston and southeast as far as West Drayton on the outskirts yeah. of London. And there wasn't a period in the 50s, or really up until the early 70s, when whenever you travelled a long distance, you'd always feel close to home because you'd see an ECC truck on the road. <laughs> uh, we were also, yeah. at one time, when we had the haul, the biggest cattle haul here in both Cornwall and Devon. Yeah. Uh, we ran yes. our own... Well, that's our, that. Yeah, yeah, our own foundry. Yeah. Uh, at Charlestown, employing 200 people. Yeah. Which I would love to all, have visited. <laughs> all our own uh, pumps and uh, quite a lot of the filtration equipment that we use in the clay dry, all manufactured in-house. Yeah. The engineering department uh, in the early 1980s, uh, there were uh, 1,500 engineers. No Everything was done Early 80s? Now. Yeah. Oh, quite teary. The clay that you see coming up the entire plain is going in a, either lorry or truck to the ports of Ploy, which is a deep water port for boats from America, or to Par or Charlestown. Here we are at Charlestown with a lorry tipping a direct into a boat. Here you see the dock gates which kept the water level to sufficient height to keep the boats afloat. You note that the dock gates are actuated by men pushing the bars of a capstan. This little port could only take boats which carried some 400 tons of clay because 
of the exceedingly narrow entrance. And in times of storm, it was quite a job getting boats in and out.